Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Kit Ingalls, University Librarian, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to the third Hive seminar uh, in this series. Uh, and a very special welcome uh, to our speaker this afternoon, Professor Michael Davis, Pro Vice Chancellor for Research here at the University of Sussex. Prior to his arrival at Sussex uh, in January 2013, Michael was Dean of Engineering at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. His research interests range from land reclamation techniques to soil reinforcement, slope stability, earthquake engineering, and mathematical modelling of soil. So actually, it must be quite disappointing to be in Sussex, but we don't have. You haven't had to use your earthquake uh, engineering skills since you've been here. In addition to his research in mainstream geotechnical engineering, he's worked in collaboration with engineers and scientists at the interface between geotechnical engineering and engineering geology and other disciplines such as climatology and biology. Interdisciplinary research projects have included the effects of global warming on alpine slope stability and the use of vegetation to stabilise slopes. This research has been funded by UK research councils, including the EPSRC, NERC, MRC and BBSRC, European Commission, current and former UK government research agencies and industry. So he is extremely well placed to speak today about funding your research, scholarship, <coughs> grants and contracts that enable your research. Michael, thank you very much. Oops. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and it's great to be here talking to you. Um, the outcome today won't be a recipe on how to apply for research grants. Um, that's not the intention. What I want to do, really, is, is, is um, uh, to give you sort of an idea, uh, just a, f a, feel, a feel, an idea of, um, of research funding, how at any stage in your career, be you uh, a, a doctoral student or, or a very senior professor, the, the, how, how it's how research funding actually means something for you. It's not something which is uh, um, somebody else does. It's something which can enhance your own career, <coughs> any stage of your career. And in fact, as, you, as I'll show later, allow you to do some really you know, fun things along the way as well. So, so what I'm going to do in the course of, and I hope I get this the right way around now, the course of, no, wrong way around. Where's the, uh, where's the, ah, there you are. Is, um, is to, it's to sort of, first of all, is very briefly sort of say, you know, why should you seek research funding? You know, what, what, what's, what's, what's the importance of doing that? Then I'm going to give a career um, example, um, looking at um, somebody's research funding history, their source of funding, and examples of their research activity. Um, since the person I know best is me, I thought, uh, without having to ask anybody, I'll do me there. And it became actually a really interesting exercise, because I've never done this before, to sit down and work out over my career, what I've actually done. And it was a, had a very interesting weekend um, on this. <laughs> Memories came flooding back, um, things like that. So I'm going to um, use a career. No, I'm not the, I, I, I come from an engineering science background, so what I, what I will show is not, for, no, not everybody's going to do similar sort of things, but it shows an example of what you can do when you think about funding. And, you know, sometimes you know, going into the field to do work, as I've done on occasions, I'd be equivalent to going to find a nice library and sitting down there with an archive and working away at it. So please do an interpretation along this. And, and sums of money be different. You're not going to do a very expensive experiment. is a lot more than you know, getting yourself to a library and sitting and living for a couple of months. So, so please you know, don't think that this, this is, the, this is, this is a, a recipe. It's just, it's just one recipe of, of not the recipe, um, recipe of, 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 uh, of many. Then, uh, then I'll just briefly to sum up after the examples, we'll, we'll take the, the majority of, of my presentation, I think you prefer to see pictures than lots of words. I'll talk a little bit about, just, just from a, again from a, from a standpoint, what sort of sorts of funding you should be seeking at, at different points of your career, and draw some conclusions and discussion, perhaps coming back up to this aspect here, um, which is not going to be ex exhaustive, but it just gives you a flavour of what I feel um, um, are important aspects to point out to people at different stages of their career. So let's get cracking. And why seek funding for your research? That's what it says at the top. Um, <laughs> and um, well, first of all, really, really important. Whatever stage of your career, facilitate networking. If you know, if you, if the, if the best people in your in your in your field um, in London, you want to jump on the train. That's funding your research. 
my, my only 23 quick career research student, that's, that's, that's your beer money gone for me. But basically, you know, it's, if, if it's only, it might be London, it might be Los Angeles, um, it, 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 might, it, it, it might be um, Moscow. It could be somewhere where the best people in your field work. Now that might be going to conferences, it might be going to meetings, um, it might be um, having, having, um, having one-to-ones with, with other researchers. Um, some of I know in my previous existences, I've run PhD conferences, for example, where student, PhD students can network in, you know, from different parts of the world and discuss similar areas and, and, and what they're doing. And actually, this formulates the, oh, the friendships and, and career um, networks for the rest of their careers, where they start working through meeting people at early stage in their career. So also, you know, people at <coughs> my stage of my career, networking is really important to find out what's going on, talk to people, find out what's happening. So at any stage of any career, networking is really important. And, you know, it costs money. And you can't always, you know, the PhD student go to supervise, say, can I please go to get a third conference? They come on, you know. Um, but there are sources, and, you know, in the university we have funding for, say, PhD students to go and do networking. Purchase major equipment. If you're a scientist, um, especially experimental scientist, as I, as I have been for my career, kits are really important. And if you want to actually do some experimentation, you need the, you need the, you need the equipment. Um, yeah, but for these days, it might be um, buying the right IT to, 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 do, you know, to, do, to do searches um, on, on some on literature projects. So it doesn't even be big, heavy bits of kit with spanners and things. It could be IT equipment, um, large, data, large, large databases, um, access to, to, to nodes for, 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 for computing, for example. So it's basically you know, purchasing stuff to actually help you do your work. The access to facilities is another area. So you might be purchasing your own nodes, your own, for example, in, in, in your, for, 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 for computing in your own university. Or you might be purchasing time on somebody else's computer. Or you uh, might be having the funding to take you to that to, to that library in Florence, where you could spend the next few months lucky you. You know, so basically, it's, it's, it facilitates those access to facilities. In my own case, early part of my career, I was jumping back of a van and drive up to Manchester to use a machine they had there until I built my own. And um, and without without the funding I could get from grants, I couldn't have done that particular research. Obviously, to fund the direct and indirect cost of a research project. Um, that might be um, to fund yourself, um, it might be to fund the doctoral student working for you or a PhD student, it might be to buy um, samples which was testing, it might be a whole host of, of different things that you need the direct costs of running a research project. And because Ian's here to buy the indirect costs of running the project, it's all the, the, basically, you, know, you, you, you're, you're, you might have the direct costs of, a, of, of, the, of the kit you need specifically for something, or the, or the samples you need, or the people working for you. There's also the cost of the lab you're working in, um, the car park where you park your car, the path you walk along to get to there, all the other aspects and, 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 and research services, research and knowledge exchange to help put, put your contracts together and help you. So there's a whole host of other things surrounding us with indirect costs. And we're always squeezed in indirect costs, but they are, they're real. <laughs> they do need paying, otherwise we don't have that infrastructure. That, we used to have this concept when I first started life, of a well-founded laboratory, they used to call it. And they'd expect you to, there are indirect costs to cover that. Fund doctoral students, many of you will be doctoral students, and some of you will, will, will have, have had, um, you know, some, for example, been part of the Chase Consortium. <laughs> Vicky LeBeau would have gone out and worked hard and with her colleagues, <laughs> got 14 million of funding to pay for doctoral students. And what, you know, well, well done, Vicky, and, and, and everybody behind that. And you're working on, um, on, a, con on a contract paid for, um, a doing your research paid for by, by a big um, AHRC contract. But also, in, 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 in other, other sources, there might be um, private funders funding or, or businesses funding PhD students, like Santander, banks, for example. There might be um, government agencies funding um, or indeed on the back of research contracts. Less and more from, on the back of, of, government, of uh, RCUK contracts, or things like the SRC these days, than used to be. But, uh, but there are other sources, various sources and various sources for funding students. So um, doctoral students, very, very important for the next generation of scholars. And indeed, for um, in the more applied sciences and getting people out there, highly qualified people doing that, that do, working in, in, in industry, commerce, government. I think a similar thing is postdoctoral researchers and fellows, a bit more expensive. Um, basically, it's again forming the next generation. So if, if you I mean, life sciences, for example, a lot of the work there is done by a mixture of postgrads and postdocs. 
working with more advanced researchers, working alongside each other, working alongside their supervisors, and um, create, create the, 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 sort of the, the workhorses of the, of the, of the lots of the research that we do. Very, very important, um, producing lots of the, the high quality research um, that's been conducted, not just at this university, but, but around the world. And, um, you know, fund your own research so you've brought out time. Um, some, in some subjects, it's, it's not kit you need, it's not even people working with you you need, but certainly in the arts and humanities and some of the social sciences, it's actually getting away, away from everything, buying your time out, you can actually have some time to concentrate and do the work. Every subject needs to concentrate and do the work, but in some subjects, only you can do it. And as, you know, in my own area, I've always been surrounded by PhD students and postdocs and, and collaborators, because that's the nature of my work. But other, other subjects, you just need to you just need to be, have the time brought out that you can go and do the work. And I'm very insistent that we should consider both. Not one's right, not one's wrong. And there are times I wish I could just brought myself out and gone hidden somewhere and got over the written work for a while. Um, there's a book in me that needs to be written, and one day I will write it. I promise myself. But I do need to get away and lock away and do it. The so publisher is very annoyed with me. And um, I think something in university which we don't perhaps realize, unless perhaps you're sitting around the tables I sit around, <laughs> is the sort of the cross subsidy from tuition fees to, fa to fund faculty research activity. Um, you know, in a university, um, uh, we know, you know, it's, it's a truism that universities get most of their money from undergraduate teaching, but most of their reputation from doing research. It's a truism. And so there is inevitably going to be a, uh, um, a subsidy from the tuition fees into the research activity. <coughs> Now, we can justify that because it creates the environment, it attracts the good people to come to the teaching, it creates the, 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 you know, we, but, but those of us who are researchers, who we can indulge ourselves in our research, have to realise that we are doing it sometimes on the back of students, undergraduate students and master students paying their fees. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing particularly wrong with that, but you need to keep that in back on one's mind. You know, when I get particularly hit up about this particular item, I always talk about you know, some poor student flicking burgers in, in McDonald's to, earn their to get their £9,000 to pay their fees so I can pop into my research somewhere. You've got to think about that. And students these days, undergraduates and post and, and taught postgrads, they you know they're paying a lot for their education. We need to realise that we have a we owe it to them to be able to be to make sure that what we're doing with their money in our research as well as in our teaching, that they, they could be proud of and they understand why we're doing it. So I think it's important to have a message to put across there. Otherwise it's seen as a you know an indulgence for faculty on the backs of undergraduates. Like don't I don't think that's true, but we have to actually scotch that once and for all. So here's a, um, a research funding history for somebody, and this is actually my research funding history. And I, um, um, and, I, and, I and, and I sort of sat at the weekend and worked out um, how many research awards have I had, and that's that's the ones that, that over the course of my career, um, and and what were the values of those awards? The bars are the numbers of awards per year, and the and the and the and the, the gold line. Um, appropriately, is the, is, the, is, the, is the earnings per year. So that's 1.2 million up there, so it gives you an idea of the thing. If, 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 since I can see Ian probably do a mental arithmetic, there's 61 grants there, and it comes about 5.8 million over a long time. So that's my, that's, that's, that was my achievement. Um, now, I'm an engineer, so you, uh, you, you do earn sort of money um, to do research you need it, so it's slightly different. Um, also, it's in, it's in pre-effect days, as we call it, so basically the grants aren't inflated by that. Um, but so, but it, that's, that's my history. And if, and if we look back at, the sort of, um, at, at where we started, I was first appointed lecturer in Cardiff back in 1983. I'm sorry. Child prodigy, <laughs> um, and, and, um, and I, I got my first grant in uh, 1985, and that was seven thousand pounds, about seven thousand one hundred or something, um, to do some to do some work. Um, and um, the next year, I actually got fifty-four thousand pounds, which was a three-year grant, the same similar sort of thing. And you can see how, in the early part of my career, I was get, I was sort of doing lots of running around getting grants. They were really quite small, relatively speaking, and they, they, there were lots of them, but, but smaller. And that's, that's what I would expect in a normal, in a normal um, career, that you would actually, earlier on in your career, you're getting, picking the science, science engineering area, 
you'll be getting smaller grants because you, you know you, you'll get you're doing little bits of work um, to actually build your, your way up. It doesn't, doesn't absolutely, absolutely that necessary, but that's what tends to happen. Um, in um, 1997, I was appointed to a professor at the University of Dundee, and um, you can see that um, two things. One, as we build up to that particular point, my, my income starts going up, and that's what put me on the map. See, oh, there's this guy down in Cardiff who, uh, who earns lots of money, <laughs> and he does research, sort of reasonable, and, and there's a, there's, there was an RAE coming along, who might be a person we can bring into our team. And I was actually um, went up from Cardiff to Dundee. Um, by the way, I'm a Welshman, happy St. David's Day to the other got to say at the very beginning, but I am. <laughs> I'm a leak here. Uh, um, and, um, and, so, um, and so I went up to Scotland and became a Scots person then. Um, and, and you'll see what happens. Immediately, my amount of money drops. Now, that's not unusual, because I was setting up a new laboratory. And I set up, and during the period from 1985 or 1983 up to 1997, I'd started off, I was using somebody else's kit. I'd started by my own kit. I set up my own laboratory, and I'll show you something of that in a minute. Set my own lab, and I started to, and with the result of this, all this, all this nice new kit I had, I was able to get bigger grants and, and, and establish myself and become an established researcher and, and be earning grants. The moment I moved to Scotland, I'd, I no longer had my nice laboratory, and I was setting up again. So although there was sort of, this is when the years, when money they were earned, so although I was still working on these grants with that peak there, <coughs> oh, there were three year grants, um, I was not in a position to apply for big grants, I was getting smaller things again, get myself re-established, until I eventually got some fairly big European and, and research council grants um, during this period here. And then um, in 2007, I became, I was appointed executive dean at the University of Auckland, and um, Ian has heard this story. When I wrote to the vice chancellor and said, "Well, this is what I need to set my lab up," and I gave him sort of two-page email about what I need for my lab, he wrote back and said, "This is what you want. We don't want you because you want to run faculty." So I was not allowed to have a, my own lab. So um, I was not expected to do research, but I did have three and a half thousand students in one faculty, and, and the best part of 400 staff, and included professional services as well as academics. So it was a big job. And regrettably, I was um, not in a position to do that much, but I did get one nice big grant um, when I was there related to um, working with colleagues um, there from, from a place to work with earthquake engineering. And then I got another one just before I left. I came here in 2013, as Kitty mentioned, and uh, 2011 there were big earthquakes in New Zealand. And on the back of that, um, I got a, a fairly decent grant, which I was working on even quite recently with colleagues from the University of Auckland. So that gives you sort of a, 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 a timeline for my, my career. And I think it does show that early in your career, you're doing smaller things, applying for mobility awards, applying for all sorts of different types of smaller grants to get, to get yourself known. You then start getting some bigger grants. And as you, as you go on, by the time I got to this stage, I had a research group of about 25 people lecturers, postdocs, PhD students. And you know, that takes a lot of feeding. And you work together in groups and platforms to get large sums of money to work together to actually to build a group. So you're on your own, getting yourself established, becoming in the middle there, sort of getting bigger grants, getting yourself get, doing really quality research. And then you're moving on to actually running larger groups and having more people working along with you. So that's a, that's a, a, a fairly, I was quite surprised it came out like that. I never, I never really had a game plan. <laughs> but it appears that I did, retro, and I retrofit onto it. So, um, Kitty gave a bit, of a, gave a bit of a list, but this is the sort, and I don't expect you to write all this down and memorise it, but this is basically the, the, type, the types of funders that paid for all that you've just seen in the last of the, so 61 grants in the last slide. So, as been said, there was research councils, um, and because of the way I saw work into disciplinarity, what they call discipline hopping, I've gone between various research councils. I've had a Leverhulme Trust Award, um, National Regional Governments, obviously Scottish Funding Council, I was working up there in Scotland, Rumney Valley District Council, um, Blind Eye Gwent District Council, good, good, Welsh, good Welsh councils, um, uh, um, Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment in New Zealand, and the Tertiary Education Committee in New Zealand. So these were various, various um, sources of, of funding. TEC is the equivalent of Hefke in this country. <coughs> EU, um, the Erasmus programme, one of my very earliest grants, actually to go and uh, you know, wander around Europe seeing networking. Actually, it's lovely. <laughs> this is my grand tour, paid for by the European Union. 
which was you know allowed me to go and visit places and build up build up networks, which actually led up to things later. The next one, the Greco one, for example, as a result of doing my Erasmus tour, visit, visiting various um, engineering um, schools around Europe, I actually met some people in Lyon um, who, who got me involved in an international um, program looking at, um, at, at, at soil behaviour, the details. But basically, um, it was really, really got me onto the European ladder by doing that, going from networking to a grant, smallish grant. Then um, European Commission, competitive and sustainable growth programs, work there with industry, and, and the two European community um, science research development big grants there, one, one, one of which I, 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 I ran on my own when I was, was, was a co, two, two of us were the, were the, were the co-organisers um, of that, and re European Regional Development Fund um, up in Scotland. But then UK government agencies, um, Wealth Development Agency, Cardiff Bay Development Corporation, Transport Research Authority, the, the list goes on, um, various things here. And companies, very important actually, sometimes initiating research, companies interested. And so they'll fund some work in a certain area on a small project, maybe funding a, a doctoral student or even a master's student for a, for a, for a period. And you, you develop you get a proof of concept and you can go and apply for larger sums of money after that. So you use them sort of scrap to catch a mackerel. Or indeed, when you've got a bigger contract, there's some little bit you want to do, and the funding will come in to sort of to, to actually to allow you to do some extra bits you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. And so some of these are quite small companies, like Ryan International, I was doing work there on, on stabilising coal tips in South Wales Valleys, believe it or not, that was that one all about, a sort of post van type of work. Um, whereas Keller Coal Creek and Stoltoff are big multinationals um, working on, this, this was actually on working on pipelines in the North Sea and how to pop up the seabed and she put enough weight on top of them, so it's interesting work there. Um, so various, th various opportunities and different things take place there. <coughs> so what I want to do now is just have a slight change in pace and have a look at some pretty pictures and, and let me explain some, some, some of the things I've done and, and hopefully put, not just showing us pretty pictures, but sort of put a commentary on, on, on you know, where the funding came from <laughs> what the, what, for, for how I managed to, 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 to work on this work. The, the first thing I talk about is the technical geotechnical sensory model. I put that front because that's my sort of that's my experimental technique that I use. And I'll explain a little bit about it in a moment. Um, and I've used that not exclusively, but along with field work, mathematical modelling, um, um, to to uh, to investigate a number of things. Now, just four of the areas I've been heavily involved with over the years. Once the area of ground improvement, I'll explain a bit about that in a moment. Uh, with, with, with a little bit I want to talk about masonry arch bridges. Pictures and some, there's a nice tale tell around that. Permafrost and cold region engineering, some interdisciplinary work, working um, with with climate, climatologists and with and with geologists, and then something on earthquake engineering, um, which has been my most recent passion. So this is a, this is a, a diagram of a geotechnical centrifuge. Now, how many of you have used centrifuges in in the lab as a scientist or? No? Yeah, yeah. So, Captain, didn't you know what I mean, really? So, you, you know, so those who don't, you have a thing that spins around. You put you put a test tube in it, or whatever. In the end, you spin it around and it separates up. Yeah, a couple of heads nodding around. Um, how many of you seen James Bond film Thunderball? Have you seen that film? Do you know where they, where they yeah, yeah. Everybody, other hands go up. You know where they, where they put it in a centrifuge and they spin it around? Well, it's this size. I have a thunder. I've had two Thunderball size. But that's actually six meters in diameter. Um, and this, this, the weight of the test, this is the test tube over here, and that's the counterweight down there. The weight of the test tube is about a ton. And you can swing this ton round at about, the maximum about 200 kilometers an hour. <laughs> they're, they're quite scary bits of kit. Um, and, and because you're doing that, lots of things happen inside. Those who are interested, I could spend a whole day talking about this, so I'm not going to. Just believe me, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a technique. Um, if you want me to come back and talk about it again, I would love to, but, uh, but, but not today, unfortunately. But let me just show you a picture. That's my first centrifuge um, at Cardiff University. Um, and you see the beam here. Um, and we actually, the, the, the reason I'm showing this is that this is, um, I got this funded. I was doing some work for, 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 for an organisation, and they had a they were doing aerospace work, and they had an old centrifuge sitting around which they weren't using anymore. And I said, "Oh, I need a centrifuge for my, my research." And they said, "Okay, we'll let you have it." So I went and collected it, um, and then I got this bit at the bottom and the bit at the top and the motor. But I had to rebuild the whole thing, um, and so there's a homemade centrifuge. Um, <laughs> um, so there's the basket at the end. Um, there's Neil, my who's my 
PhD student at that particular point um, working with me um, on this. Um, we would put, so you put sample. What happens when you start? It's a bit like putting um, water in a bucket. That's the edge of bucket. You know, if you swing, we've all done this, of course. You put water in the bucket of the string, and as you swing it around, the bucket lifts up. Yeah, and the water and the bucket lifts up, and the water stays in the bucket. Yeah, that's what we do here. Think of that as the bucket with the water in it, or the test tube, and it spins up as we go around. And because of the Increasing the gravity, just very, one very quick bit of science, and I'll, I'll stop. Um, one very quick bit. Because you're increasing the gravity, you increase the weight of the solids at the end there. And so those of you can all remember H rho G, yeah? If you go down into a liquid, the, the pressure is the depth, <laughs> look at some the science in the back row, sorry, apologies for the <laughs> simplicity. So you go down, you go down, you, you, you go down into a liquid, the, the, the depth increases, the, the density of the material rho time multiplied by the depth times acceleration due to gravity that gives you the, the pressure at a certain point of the liquid. Now what we do in a centrifuge is something very similar. We because soil behaviour um, depends on itself on the self weight, I'm getting, I'm getting really getting really deep down here. Soil behaviour depends on self weight. So basically if you think about it, if you've ever tried to, to push a hole into the ground all the time or stick a Christmas tree into a pot. It's very easy to start off as you push it further and further, but it gets difficult. Or indeed, if you try to push your finger into a bowl of sugar, um, it's easy at the top, but it gets more difficult as you push it down. And what's because, because the soil is, is stronger as you go deeper, because there's more interparticular stress actually pushing it together. The particles are pushing together. I didn't think I was going to talk about soil mechanics today, so apology. <laughs> uh, pushing closer together. And so, um, and so the greater the stress is, so because they act on friction, if there's not much stress there, it's very easy to move. If there's a lot of stress there, you can't move it. So what we do, we have soil, we put it into a centrifuge, we spin it. So what we do is we build a model where we decrease the height of the model, but we increase the gravity. So h rho g, it becomes h divided by n, we normally call n, number of gravities. Rho, we use the same material, the same soil, and then g, the acceleration to gravity, we multiply that by n. So any particular point in a model, the, the, the stress will be the same as in the field. And that, that way you can actually model field behavior at small scale using a centrifuge machine like this. And there are lots of other, I was going to say spin-offs, there are lots of other things that, that will actually will apply um, when you're doing this sort of work, like, um, um, but I'm not going to, I've already gone too deep. But the, model, the modeling technique is there, so you can actually model things. The way you grasp at small scale, it behaves the same as that in the field. That's, that's the important thing. This is the business end again. This time I got an arch bridge in there, and so you can take photographs. The thing spins up, that, so there's a different type of end there. And I'll talk a bit about some of that data in a minute. This is my posh one. When I went to Dundee, I was at my interview for Dundee, and I said, Well, if you want me to come here and you want me to repeat what I've done in Cardiff, you're going to have to give me the tools of my trade. So I use that very word, embarrassing now. Um, and and, they, and they said, What do you need? And I said, I need a geotechnical centrifuge. I built my last one, but I would quite like to buy one off the shelf next time, because it's really not the right companies who build these, actually down in a French, a French company. And uh, they said, OK, we'll loan you the money. All right. <laughs> so, um, so basically it meant that I had to get research grants. And the first call on the, on the overhead was to pay back my loan. And these things are not cheap. Um, and pay back the loan. And then, then what was the then? Oh no, but not the okay, there's an access charge. But I basically had to charge myself an access charge so I could pay that access charge back to the university to pay for my kit. So basically, I did a deal with the university where I, I, they bought me the kit up front and I paid for them on a hock. I was there for 10 years and I cleared my debt before I left. So I felt quite pleased with myself. So I cleared it, so I cleared it by hook. So, but, but, then, but then basically, there's the machines, so it's a lot posher. And those of you who've noticed, the, the, the one in college was red. And this one is blue. Unfortunately, I never was able to build a black one in New Zealand, which is a great shame. That was my, was my, was always my intention. And that's what the letter I had back from the BC saying, you're not going to have black centrifuge. And that's the other end. That's Tim Newsom, one of my former PhD students and then postdocs, um, working on the business end there. Um, with lots of instrumentation coming off. We take lots of readings and things as it's flying around. So we just don't put it there and watch it. We actually have up to 90 channels of instrumentation with the sensors of various stuff in there, measuring things, television cameras, um, and basically watching and, and, and measuring things that are going on as the processes. And the last thing I bought, the last grant I had before I left Scotland, was to buy an earthquake actuator to put on the end of the centrifuge. Um, 
it, only, it didn't arrive till after I left. But um, but basically, um, this is the, actually one the, 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 that's the, from the manufacturers, but not the one that actually sits on our centrifuge in Dundee. But basically, um, it's an actuator. It means as you're spinning around about 200 miles an hour, 200 kilometers an hour, beg your pardon, you can actually actuate an earthquake. With, with, with something on top of it to see what happens when you have an earthquake on, a, on an embankment or a building, this sort of thing. So it's, it can all be done in flight. It's great fun, actually. <laughs> um, when I was once showing some people around my centrifuge centre and uh, some quite senior folk from, from a government department, one of them turned to me and said, Michael, he said, um, they pay your salary as well. So, uh, <laughs> so if, you, but if you're not enjoying your research, no point. Maybe that's a point you should take away from here as well. So I'm going to talk a bit about ground improvement, and this is something which I spend a lot of time on, is soil nailing. So what is soil nailing? And when you, when you start seeing this, you should walk, as you go around the, net, the road network, you'll keep on seeing it. Basically, traditionally, when you, when you want to um, support a slope, you would maybe put a big brick wall or a big stone wall or something like that. But that's, that's, a, that's, that's a little bit sort of you know, passe now, really. So what, but what you, the other way you can do it is, is, to, is to actually put inclusions into the ground, so like rods or bars. And, 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 and really, so it's why I always call it holding it up by its own bootstraps. So basically, by installing rods into the ground, you can actually stop this slope from collapsing. You know, the clever thing is how many you put in, what the spacing, what size, what strength, and that's what research is all about. But basically, that's the general principle. And as rather crudely, I've shown the front being green. The, the difference being, then you can actually plant grass on the outside, or shrubs and things like that, and you have a green finish rather than a hard finish which is much more environmentally acceptable. So, um, and indeed, it's better for the environment, although you might have two big lorries thundering way down there. But it's also very quick um, to do, as opposed to traditional construction, because you can do it in stages. But so it's, 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 so I spent a lot of my career working on this and, and similar um, ground improvement techniques. We call it, this is called saw nailing for obvious reasons. Um, this is a, um, a saw nailing cannon, which um, I, was, I was one of the first people to have a fire. I mean, there's a slope here, and it sits on the end, and this cannon here was originally, this is, this is, this is real um, swords into plowshare stuff. This cannon was designed by the Americans for delivering chemical weapons, right? And then some bright spark, not me, unfortunately, got the good idea, said, well, rather than doing that, why don't we turn it around and use it for firing inclusions into the ground? So he got the patent for all uses of the cannon. We didn't do that, but you did that. And it's clever in this IP, it's a lesson there for all of us. But then he needed some saw mechanics back, back in technical engineering. So I worked with him, and that was done, that was done, actually done um, on a Welsh railway embankment, really back in the mid 90s. And what was great, when I arrived in New Zealand, I found they were using a very similar technique, the same, same cannon, well, not exactly the same cannon, the same type of cannon, um, actually repairing. The good thing about it, you came in very quickly, you put these things in very, very quickly. And an embankment had failed on a motorway in just up north of Auckland, and they were able to come in and quickly pin it back. It was like sort of something hammering a few nails in, but they thought about how best to repair it in the long term. And so they're using this, so it was really nice to arrive in New Zealand and find this technique that I've been sort of one of the pioneers of being used right around the other side of the world. Because not, this doesn't always happen. Construction industry is very, very conservative, and things that happen locally don't often um, move, move around. So I got some funding. This is my first EPSRC grant. Um, having had small sums of money from companies to look at the one called Storm Day Limited who did that first work, actually to build a big shear box. Now, what's a big shear box? So well, basically, it's a big box which you can move um, one side relative to the other. So there's a in the middle here, just between these, just between these two things. There's a, there's a shear there. You can put a, so basically, you can fill it with soil, put bars in it, and you can pretend you've got a slope that's failing. Um, if I got a company to pay for the box and I went to EPSRC and got the money for the grant to do the work on it thereafter. So it was a, a combination of getting a company to do a proof of concept. And with that proof of concept, I could apply for funding to the EPSRC. A bit like the grants we have here going, you know, where we're giving people the small sums of money to, to do some tests to show it works. It's like our research development fund. Very similar thing, but I went out and had to go out and get, get it from outside. Proved it, then got an EPSRC grant um, and worked on that. That was actually is the biggest shear box ever built in the world. <laughs> <laughs> also a pain to use, I can tell you. That. This is probably why it's the only one that's ever been built. Um, but it's not always so nice. And this is actually back in the Welsh Valleys again. And this is showing um, the construction technique with a digger digging out the soil, um, the facings coming down, um, you know, um, raining. Um, 
putting the nails in. So it's, you know, it's this heavy duty civil engineering going on taking place here. Um, and very often, or not often, very often, but frequently they fail. You can see here where one of these structures has failed. And so with, um, my, with the centuries modeling technique that I did, I was looking at, uh, I got, f again, more funding from the research councils to look, and with actually from the Transport Research Laboratory, to look and um, building a model. This is the size being taken off. You can see how this is a scale model um, of a six meter high wall. It's about that high. But when you spin it around to crew, that one's only six metres high, um, similar to that one you've just seen. And what we could do is introduce water and let the thing fail and monitor all that's going on at the time. So those of interested, I'm happy to talk on another occasion about that. But it occurred to me when I was doing this work that what we were doing with saw nails on the left-hand side there was actually very similar to what saw roots do. Um, so... Um, so um, I rather cheekily applied to the um, EPSRC for a, um, um, offer for funding to, to investigate the fundamental behaviour of how soil roots um, um, strengthen um, slopes. And believe it or not, they funded it. I was actually delighted. So we were able to do work where we could use the, the mathematics and the, and, the, and the mechanisms we developed um, for soil nails and apply them to root systems, but actually do modelling tests to show how and if they, and if they worked. Because one of the difficulties to do is these things in the field is you can't say, well, let's now ask for you know, um, two days of prolonged rainfall. But you can do that in, in, in a model and, and, and let the thing fail and see what's happening. So you can, and you can monitor, and you can make analogues and things to make that happen. And so, if I can get the thing to work. There we are. And so, we planted um, willows um, on the slope in the lab, in the lab conditions. Um, grew the willows a certain size and then ran an experiment and, uh, and, and I did not initially have a video in to show what happened but I, didn't have, but I decided to, to leave that up but, but basically we did the same thing there and got some really interesting results out of that. Um, dynamic compaction is another area and this is where again a number of things came together. We worked for um, a company um, AMEC um, to look at using this, this concept of dynamic compaction. What it does is if you want to build something low rise building and, you, and you, the soil isn't strong enough, maybe a ground field site, something like that, you can come along and it's, it's, quite, it's, you know, it's quite agricultural. You come along, this is a pile driver, which you would normally use for bashing piles into the ground, and you put a, a big plate at the bottom of it here and you thump the plate like crazy and you basically go around, you know, a bit like a tamper and you tamp the ground. You do it with six ton forward and weight, basically. But, it's, but it's, a, it's a little bit sort of um, uncontrolled. So, so, so because of my interest in dynamics and things at the time, they came to me and AMEC came to me and said, look, you know, can you do some work? And eventually we managed to get some fun funding for field trials from the MOD. This is my PhD student here, Sarah, down next to a Terex. This is the military version of it, um, where they were interested in airfield damage repair. Quite frank, this is what they were doing after the, during the Falklands War. Um, the, um, the, 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 basically, planes couldn't land on an airfield because... The, well, the way you apparently fight these wars you go in and blow up people's airfields. So there's a way of quickly repairing air, airfields. And so they were interested in that. But it paid the money for us to work on developing a technique for monitoring not a performance spec, as we say, you could do 10 blows, then move on, but saying, well, when you get the correct strength, strength or, or stiffness in this case, stiffness, you move on to the next. It forms a, a way of operating the system. So Sarah, so that was, she did her PhD using these various bits of kit. And now it's actually being used again um, in, uh, in the field, sort of posh, you know, everything has to be posher and more sleek, uh, a posh, posher and sleeker um, um, version of the kit run by Panin Engineering, who are from the north of England. But as I, put, I, I had to put my Mason stuff in because it's for no reason. One, I really like it. And two, it's, it's, it's another one of my EPSRC grants. Where I, well, what I did, I was looking, we were looking at... Um, how um, there's a lot of work being done on masonry bridges, but oh, because these are things we've done since the Romans, before the Romans. But basically, the, 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 the analysis of them is still fairly basic. And when EU regulations are bringing larger lorries in to, onto, onto our roads, allowing them more axles and greater, greater axle weights, the Department of Transport was just didn't know if the bridges would be strong enough. And so they wanted to review the analytical methods. So one way of doing this is to go and break lots of bridges, and I'll show you a broken bridge in a moment. The other way is to try and do something a bit cleverer and test your methods out or develop new methods against model tests. And so that's how I got involved. And that's a standard brick. 
or as they call them, masonry units in the trade. So that's the standard masonry units, and to take out and amuse and amaze your friends this evening. Um, that, that, that's a quarter, that's a six, and that's a twelfth scale masonry unit. Um, which, uh, and in fact, it, there's a lot of stuff about strength of materials in here as well, which about when you get to smaller and surface energies and all sorts of things, I'm not going to go into, but it's a really interesting fundamental study of material science, let alone bridges. So we built some bridges, and that's in, it's got a formwork. A great PhD student, this was really, really good. But the, the, the great thing about this project was the EPSRC funded it. And I employed a, um, a postdoctoral student to actually to, to do the research um, on breaking bridges and the new analysis. And then I, I also managed to put the time, you could put in a PhD student. I got the PhD students to take these bridges and work out means of repairing them. So I got two for the price of one. So what the, the, the postdoc would do is test, hand over this bridge to um, the, the uh, model to the, to the uh, uh, PhD student. So off you go, you do something with it. And so developing ways of techniques of, of repairing them. And so we got two for the price of one in this project. Really, really interesting. Um, that shows, it's a bit of a black, sorry, it's a bit of an old, but this is the one we're modeling. Is it, that's a, that, that's a, a full scale, about six meter that, um, span bridge real bridge over a canal which has been broken at great expense by the Department of Transport to see what happens when you break a bridge. Now, first of all, there are not that many around, and when you do do this to them, it costs you an awful lot of money to clear up afterwards. And so, but what we could do in the lab is for the same price as probably one of those bridges, we could run a whole program doing different, different, different dimensions, different, different, uh, different types of of, 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 of arched height, width, um, different loading mechanisms, and we could do that. And so that's, keep that in your mind, and that's the one in the field, and this is the one in our lab. Um, and, um, and you can see that we've got the same failure mechanisms. Um, you see a little bridge there. We have a TV camera in there, you can see the bottom there. In fact, when you've got the TV thing spinning around and you've got the TV camera on, you'd think you've got a full scale bridge when you're watching it because you don't know how far away it is. And so we've got various instrumentation on here. And so um, these were, they call them nori bricks, it's, but they call them nori bricks because when they make them, they call them iron bricks on the side of the mole. It comes out when you take the mold off. There's nori on the side of the line. That's like, it. Took me about three years to realise that. So I, I feel like I need to. I need to tell you. <laughs> Just to change the pace a wee bit. This is me actually doing some real work. Um, and uh, this is where I got involved with perma I should say permafrost and coal regions engineering up there. Um, talking with um, colleagues in geology when I was at Cardiff University, developed an interest. Um, in they were very interested in permafrost and. And, and, has, and basically looking at the mechanisms of the geomorphology of how, of how slopes operate, especially in, 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 in with, with cold regions. And then particularly there were cases of more, more slope failures as a result of, of, of climate change, um, slopes which are more quickly advancing, slopes are failing, um, what they call active detachments, but as a result of more rapid thawing during, during the summer um, and less freezing during the winter. And so there was a, there was a really interesting from a morphological point of view, but also from an engineering point of view, because this is soil mechanics, which I, know, which I understand. But also it's how you know, that those geomorphological processes actually interact with, 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 uh, with humanity, if you like. And so you know, if that's above a main road, or it's got a ski, ski, ski slope on it, or um, you know, um, somebody's house is on it, how, how do we actually analyze what's going on and predict into the future and whether people should move and assess the safety. And so this is actually in, in Norway. There's a nice lake behind me there. We're actually putting a borehole in, um, sort of, um, and uh, uh, I'm at one end of a, of a long bar. We've sort of got, a, got an auger down there. I'm running around with my technician. Um, I did, it wasn't the only time I had a photograph taken. Ian's looking at me as if it's, yeah, you stood there for I was actually doing some work, not just standing there to have my photograph taken. And that's our field station that we had, that we left that. And over the winter, it became covered in snow, and we took lots of measurements. And it's a, a means of measuring slope. I'm not going to go into details, but it just shows where we were in Norway. We're also interested in, for, for, for scientific reasons, much, um, uh, much uh, uh, deeper fr freezing. And we had, we had a European, we started off, that was the NERC contract, one of the first one. Then because we did this initial work, we were able to apply for and got a, a European contract called PACE. Permafrost and Climate in Europe, always got a good name for an European contract, and uh, we were joint coordinators. And this is up in, up in, um, in, in Svalbard, um, where this, uh, there had been a building on that, and you can see where, the, because the slope has moved, all the, pile, the piles that were sitting on piles 
have moved along with it. And we were able to monitor various places around, around there doing field work. One of the things you've got to watch for in Svalbard is the polar bears. So whilst you're sitting there uh, with your backside up in the air doing things on the floor, you have to have people standing behind you with their guns in case the polar bear comes and wants to eat you. So uh, it's, not, it's, it's, it's an interesting experience. We've been there about two, two times now. Um, um, I'm not sure I want to go again. <laughs> but I've got, I can tick it off my bucket list if you know it. I've been to Svalbard. Really, really interesting. Very bleak. But um, very interesting place to work. But you do need... The first thing to do is train you how to... Um, but then, but, but hopefully you don't have to do it, but you have to have somebody stand behind you um, and, and guard you whilst you're doing the field work. And these are master students from the, from the search station. You see, you do interesting things when you get people to fund your research here, don't you? Um, and then we actually were doing this in the lab as well. Um, this is actually in France, in Caen. Um, we're working there with, 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 the, with, the, with the French CNRS. Um, and there are two slopes here we're subjecting to. So basically, what we're doing in the field, we're doing so in the, in the, basically in a year in the field, it sort of freezes and thaws. And, and then you're looking over a couple of years what happens to a slope and whether it slides away and what sort of rates it goes. So that takes a year. In Caen, I was going back there for five or six years. Uh, my wine collection was never as good. Um, and um, every, every, every month for a year, I'd go over there because a, a, a year. In, on this experiment was about a month. So basically in a month you could do, do that. So over a period of five years you could get quite a few cycles in to see what happens. And this is what she was at the end of the process. Um, um, what we, was we all went over and what we called the big dig, where we dug it all out and saw what was going on. So that, that shows it there. In a centrifuge, because of modelling laws, you can do that in half a day. So in a centrifuge, and what I have here is a model after testing. It's actually a retaining wall. It shows a slope moving down a retaining wall. Shows that wall would have been vertical start off. And show after a series of, of teasing and thawing how it damages structure. And so we've got various instrumentations being cut away to see. And then also looking at, at, at rock slope stability. Um, in fact, this part of the contract, in fact, my highest cited paper is on this particular work because I worked out about... Um, uh, it's pretty obvious, really, that, um, that as ice gets warmer, it gets it gets less strong. So you can have an ice joint up there holding that, that cable car station up, and if it's going to be frozen, it's safe. It's, it's like glue. When it's not, when it's actually there's no ice in there at all, the joint closes up, and so it's safe. But as the as the as the ice goes through being very cold, but not but not melting, but being less cold, the, the ice actually loses strength. Now, explaining it seems very odd, but people haven't picked up on this. And therefore, during, there's a period where your slope is no longer safe. Um, but in fact, it's, it goes to a phase as the temperature rises where the actual stability can, it can become, it gets less, st less stable, but it can become unstable and the whole thing could go off. And in fact, um, they were actually at that particular time drilling here for the site of a new, a new, um, new, st new st station. In fact, I showed this very slide at a, at a seminar in Zurich, um, so about the time I was doing this work at a, at, a, at a seminar, and there was an engineer there from the Engadine where this work was being conducted, and he said, and he said, oh, I'm doing a new cable car station just around the corner, um, and um, and I explained what the situation was, and, I, and he said, oh my God, he said, we're putting boreholes down, but we're not measuring the temperature, and, he, and he, his wife wasn't very pleased with him actually, because he was just about to go, and he comes to Zurich, to come to the seminar, to go for this two weeks annual holiday. And he said, I've got to go back to the Engadine country because I've, I've got to get this sorted. So I've got somebody's holiday. Maybe his marriage as well. Um, so, so, um, so, and so, but basically, that's, so this, this is a very, you know, one of the things I'm particularly not proud of that, but particularly proud of this particular piece of work. But again, we got it in the centrifuge. This is Omar. Uh, Omar uh, now works at the University of Nottingham from Syria originally. He came to see me and, I, and, and he said, I want your PhD on rock mechanics. He said, great, I've got just a project for you, I said. Um, it's working on frozen, frozen ground. He said, I've never seen snow or ice. <laughs> um, but he was a great, 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 um, great PhD student and now works at Nottingham University. And we did slope stability. Now, it's not all bad. Um, this is actually is going off to do some field work for the day with my friend Charlie Harris, who was the joint coordinator. And that's me on the left with my skis on. Anybody knows me knows I'm an absolutely appalling skier, but to get sometimes off piece to go to your, where your boreholes are, you have to you have to sort of muddle on and get on with it. So you know, it's uh, this is all paid for by the European Commission. Thank you very much. Finally, I'm going to talk a bit about earthquake engineering, um, and um, 
particularly some work I did on um, on fault ruptures. Um, this is a um, this was a track in 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 um, in, in uh, Korea before the Chi Chi earthquake, and that's the uh, track after the earthquake, after there'd been a, no a, a, a normal fault movement of about three meters on that, something like that, particular gate. It was about nine meters in other places. So then you know, the, the, the fault came along, that happened to be on the track. So it might be good for steeple chasing now, but certainly not for Olympic running. Um, so that's sort of the, 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 the type of behavior. Now, um, is there nothing, okay, not enough of that is known about what happens with fault rupture. Other than say, when you have a fault rupture, people are more concerned, and for, for very rightly, in earthquakes by the, by, by the vibration and the vibration knocking down buildings, and we'll talk about that later on the subsequent for that. But really, not about fault rupture. And the, and the European Code was fairly, um, had nothing in it at the time about it. So I, I put together a European contract called Quaker, good name again, looking at earthquakes. I'm um, looking at two aspects of earthquakes. One was on piling, I want um, foundations. The other was on foundations near, the, because the two areas which weren't, weren't very well described foundations near this sort of fault rupture. And in fact, there was a Chi Chi earthquake in 1999, but also there was an earthquake in Turkey, um, in, 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 in Izmir. Um, and this was in um, so, um, the same year. And this was really was to spark this off, because you see this chap standing down here, it's immediately after the earthquake. And you see this house, I'll show another picture in a minute, but if you notice that house, there's no broken windows. Even the telephone line still goes through quite comfortably. Um, no, not even windows have flown over, let alone, let alone done. But there's a, but it sort of seems to be, I'll show the picture, in front of that scarp. Now, there was a huge throw there. And um, and this is a couple of days later when everybody comes in and starts taking pictures. And actually, if you look at the side of the photograph where that guy in the red shirt is standing, it comes in, and in fact, what happened was the, the earthquake fault came along, it met the building, it took a left, went around the back of the building, took a right, and came out the other side again. <laughs> and there, there, there it is. It comes up here, around the back. And you see the back of the house. That was the back door. You know, you can imagine sitting there going, oh, and go get the cat in, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and the back door is, uh, is actually now sitting um, at about two and a half metres down below the surface of the ground. Um, uh, no broken windows. Interestingly, the, I, I unfortunately didn't get onto this reconnaissance mission. Uh, but what the people did was talking to the owner of the house, who said that she'd been sitting in the, there having a cup of tea in the kitchen, and, and she said it felt like being in a lift. And, and she was drinking a cup of tea, apparently. And she said, I said, oh. And I, I, seem to, I seem to have lost my garden, you know, and, I, and it was, and it was, it was that was that 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 disconcerting. Now, awful earthquake, awful lot of people died, so we shouldn't laugh about these sort of things. But it's difficult sometimes, you know, these sort of interesting phenomena. But basically, the the fault rupture came along around the back. And that now, there were other buildings, and, and regrettably, different construction. And what was interesting with this in this part of Turkey, they actually asked the people who built the, the houses. And in fact. The people who built the foundations of these houses weren't the men who were sitting there with their worry beads, but the women who built the foundations. And they, they were talking to women who'd done most of the building work there. And they said, yeah, well, we built these big, huge slabs. And so the foundations were, were very, very stiff, very stiff and very, and very massive. They built these lattice foundations. Um, and also put quite a large building on top of it. So it was quite a heavy, stiff building. Now, just around the corner from there was the local mosque. And the fault ruptures here is a couple of days later, so it's been covered. And you'll see that was completely destroyed. That's the reason was because of an arcaded building, heavy building on little, on little um, foundations which, which could move around, not stiff, um, not, and not locally heavy, this arcade. Um, and so the whole building collapsed as a result of this, this, this large movement, this, 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 this movement. What's interesting is the minaret didn't get shaken over. You can imagine that huge thing sitting there. And that was actually very, very stable and didn't actually get disturbed. And it was really close. That minaret was right next to the, right next to this skull. And, and probably, deflected it um, forward as a, as a way to the minaret, lots of weight locally. So it's a really, really interesting phenomenon. And, and how could we understand this? And so again, we turn to my little friend, the centrifuge, and this is a test we did, where we actually, um, we built models, that's equivalent to a, of about 30 meters thickness of, of soil, big, huge jack underneath here, and as we were spinning around, we actually lowered the soil and created a fault rupture. And we did. And we did a series of tests, some with no structures there, some with structures there. And what we found, and you just start to see it here, is when you started the fault rupture, you can see on the right-hand side, it starts to move up to go right, and we arranged it so we'd, we'd actually go right from the middle of the structure. But basically, as, as the movement takes place, it actually diverts 
and goes around. And we looked at different weights of structure and or masses of structure, different different sizes, different stiffnesses. So we could actually say what is the, what are the mechanisms which cause this to happen. And that was the European Union. And here we have one of my models here from Dundee, and in the European Union, um, things, people from Na National Technical University of Athens were doing a fine element analysis on this, and we were able to compare models for fine element analysis. So we could actually take our models, validate the analyses, so we could then actually predict things in the field. So it takes it back one stage further and spur back. I'm almost finished. Yeah. <laughs> the last thing we talk about is, um, is something which is very close to my heart five years ago, almost to the day. Um, the Christchurch earthquake, the, the big one as we call it, um, where this, the, basically the, the centre of the city was devastated. Um, I was in Auckland at the time, so I was a long way away. There were only two major engineering departments in, in New Zealand and I was happy to be head of one of them. And so I got involved very soon after the earthquake. Um, this buildings where um, quite a few people were killed. You see it's what they call pancaking, where the building comes down. Only two buildings did this fortunately because the design codes are pretty good. Um, but you can see from what we call lateral spend in the ground, um, that's where the, the, the soil has, because this is what they call liquef liquefaction, soil liquefies, and there's a bit of a slope or next to a river, it starts to open up. And she's going to be standing in, it shouldn't have been standing there. Um, you can see more, more, more movement, and yet more movement against by the Yacht Boat Club, where, where they, you see the soil cracking like that. Um, Liquefaction, a simple person's car, um, the, ground, the ground does seriously liquefy. And, and then you have a series of ejecta come to the surface. This is, this is, this is a, I had to wear a face mask. Um, uh, in fact, there was people from the, uh, from the uh, in Times of India came and took photographs. My, my research team were really annoyed because they took a picture of me with the face mask looking very serious. And all of them were doing all the hard work, let's be honest, were ignored. <laughs> they probably were doing hard work and I was standing there not doing anything at the time. So basically, um, the um, dust, very dusty um, silt, and, um, and you can see the thickness of it that came up through the ground there um, and was cleared away. Um, there, I can only speak volumes for the students in uh, Canterbury University students in Christchurch because they mobilised themselves and they went into the, they went down into the city and they got wheelbarrows and shovels and they went around, they dug everything out and helped people out. You know, undergraduates when they volunteer can be absolutely fantastic and that's what they did. And they helped, you can see what's happened to that, to that wall and you can see what happens to structures. That you see the, the, the lawn has parted there, the house has come apart. Um, and that's a bridge, looking, there's a bridge deck here, that's the abutment coming up, then you can see how, because of the movement around the river, the, the, the road is separated apart, and in fact, the road dropped just over a metre, and there's the foundation, it's, it's rotated by about 15 degrees, um, and there was still traffic going over the top, and I was standing there taking that photograph, thinking, should I be standing here? Um, you can see where the foundation, and in fact, you, know, you can look at where that chap is standing, and the uh, foundations were, were pretty badly damaged. So going back to my career path and the different stages, I really this is probably the last thing I want to show, is just to really, <laughs> if I've left any time for discussion, um, basically the sort of, the sort of um, funding at different times of career. They said this is not an exhaustive list, this is, this is not a recipe. This is just sort of the sort of things that you might want to be involved with. Um, and certainly as a doctoral student, you obviously need to keep body and soul together, you need a student, you need to pay your fees. Um, like obviously, there are research costs. If you do some work, you, you need research costs. My own PhD, for example, um, I was doing work on um, using this big centrifuge, which, which needs to be done. And in fact, I, worked, my, my, I did wrote my very first research proposal when I was a PhD student to actually get funding, um, which went in the name of my supervisor, which I haven't claimed it, um, to actually fund the work I was doing there on embankments. Um, obviously, went to good conferences, um, specialist training, perhaps, and, and networking. Postdoctoral fellows, um, so all of the above, plus I suppose fellowships in the various location spaces you can get, go for, for, for fellowships, um, be they the Royal, Academy, the Royal Academy of Engineering for people like me or British Academy for people in the arts. Um, funding from PI's grant, postdoctoral have been employing you, obviously they're, they're funding to pay for you and for what you're doing and obviously you want to go to networks and conferences. Now what I would call early career researcher, um, Obviously, you want networking, your fellowships to, to allow you to buy your time out to actually get on with your research. Um, first grants, AHRC has Lieberhum, um, e the EPS, ESRC Future Leaders, various grants for early career researchers, um, start grants in the ERC, that's the big one, European Research Council, one and a half million euro. Very nice. You can get that one. Um, and we're pleased as well. Um, and, um, and really good, good, and things like the Royal Society. Obviously, industry, um, more, you know, 
go to Ministry of Commerce generally, um, government departments to, to help you get, get funding. There's also what I call a returning researcher, uh, for people who've been out um, having children coming back or had, uh, had, 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 had caring responsibilities. Daphne Jackson Trust, we've had We've had Daphne Judge, Judge, Judge Fellows here, and we, we actually fund that here, and Dorothy Hodgkin Fellowship from the Royal Society. So, for, particularly for women returning, although it's, it's not just for women, but, but, but mainly, mainly women coming back to work, um, then it's, it's a really useful thing for help for easing people back into their research um, once, once, they, once they've been away. More established, um, you know, same as with career, career, but the various things like responsive mode and, and, uh, and directed calls, EU framework program. Um, Investigator awards for the MRC, um, consolidated grants from the ERC that gets a bit bigger as you get more senior. Um, people like charities, Levy Humes, RC UK, people like that, and indeed industry government. And finally, there's a senior researcher, so you've got lots of mouths to feed, you probably want platform grants, working in partnership with other organisations, um, and more advanced grants. So basically, you know, it just gets bigger as you go through your career. Because that you're because you're actually working with larger teams. And from from a scientist point of view now, we'll be working with larger teams. Now for you know for some of the arts, humanities, social sciences, the same things apply. Um, but, uh, but perhaps the numbers aren't, aren't so big, but you might want a social scientist, um, you know, Anne Lester who works with me, for example, as director of interdisciplinary research, he's, he's gone down that model and he's, he's now got a big AHRC grant with, um, is it AHRC? He's got a Leverhulme, is it? Leverhulme grant. You've got two postdocs working with him um, on, on, on colonial history. So, you know, so it's, it doesn't have to be scientists who build teams. And so, but, 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 um, but, but and, and, and scientists don't have to have big teams either. So it depends on the work you do. So absolutely finally, if you'd be pleased, very pleased to know. Um, just to make conclusions, I think at any stage of your career, and irrespective of your discipline, that's really important, um, funding from external to enhance opportunities for conducting high quality research. It's here to help enhance what you're doing, makes, makes what you do more interesting, more uh, uh, enhance what you do. I think for some disciplines it's essential to, you know, of my own, I think, I had to get out there fighting for money, otherwise I couldn't do what I wanted to do. I could, I think, I spent my whole life writing computer programs, I didn't really fill me with joy. Um, and so, uh, but, and, but basically, getting equipment, access to facilities, other activities, going out on the site and that sort of thing. Yeah, obviously, it depends on the date. So I, I reiterate, you know, you need money, but it's not that one size doesn't fit all. You know, even within, within a discipline, I, in my own discipline, where I'm an experimentalist, so I need expensive kit. If I was sitting in front of a computer all day long, I wouldn't need. To, I might need postdocs and things like that, but I wouldn't need expensive kit. You know, so basically, it depends on what you're trying to do. So it varies between disciplines and also within disciplines. Inter, I suppose, the inter. Um, External funding does allow you to build teams, and um, where appropriate, I think it's not everybody is working on teams, but you know most people do like to build work together on occasions, and create and also you know create space for yourself that, that allows you to do high quality research. So that's a fine out of your time, or um, you know of 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 being able to, you know part of your time or all of your time. I think that's an important aspect of funding, and in some disciplines. Um, Particular groups, more senior research, I think have a greater incentive to seek researching for research platforms and partnerships. You know, because if you've got a big group, you need to keep that group growing. Um, and I have to keep that group growing, I suppose, but, but, but basically, as your research grows, you, your, 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 your role changes within the research environment, if you like. And finally, and last but no means at least, you know, external and life do some really interesting things, you know, um, um, which you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. We hadn't had that, uh, that extra bit of money to help you get on with it. Now that's where I will say I'll stop. Thanks so much, Michael. Thank you.